Welcome to the first week of our brand new series on the channel. Y'all voted and y'all chose. In the History of series, we go through the history of different college football programs in a multi-part series. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like, share, and subscribe, as well as letting me know which school you want to see in future episodes. Due to being one of the teams to play in the first ever game of college football, and due to the fact that I'm originally from New Jersey, I thought it'd be perfect to have the first set of episodes focus around Rutgers football. The first college football game occurred on November 6th, 1869, between Rutgers and New Jersey, who would later be known as Princeton, in New Brunswick, New Jersey, in front of about 100 people. The game played that day was much different than the one we know and consider football today. Each school fielded a team that consisted of 25 players, and they played under what can be considered more rugby-like rules. One Rutgers player described the game as replete with surprise, strategy, prodigies of determination, and physical prowess. The Rutgers captain, whose name was William J. Leggett, recommended the two schools play under the rules from the London Football Association. Leggett would later become a distinguished clergyman of the Dutch Reformed Church. Princeton's captain, William Gummier, who later became Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of New Jersey, accepted Leggett's proposal. Now, how did this game come together? Well, Rutgers and Princeton are located about 20 miles apart, and as a result, they had an intense rivalry. They competed for the possession of the old revolutionary cannon. They would take the cannon from each other at night and lug it back and forth from the opposing schools. Princeton stopped this by putting the cannon in concrete, as well as beating Rutgers in baseball by a close score of 40-2. to two. I hope you sense the sarcasm. Rutgers was angry about this game and wanted to get revenge to square things away. Rutgers issued a challenge to Princeton that they would play three games in one year. The first would be played at Rutgers, the second would be played at Princeton. The first matchup, also known as the first college football game, took place at 3 p.m. with 50 total players and 100 spectators. The spectators sat on a low wooden fence to watch the game. The players' uniforms consisted of hats, coats, vests, and they used suspenders as belts. To distinguish the Rutgers players and fans, they donned scarlet scarves. The way they positioned themselves was really interesting in my opinion. Two players on each team remained stationary near their opponent's goal line in hopes to slip a score past the defense. The remaining 23 players were divided into two groups, fielders and bulldogs. 11 players lined up as fielders and served as the team's defense, while the remaining 12, the bulldogs, played a more offensive position. Each score counted as a game and they were going to play a total of 10 games. Following each score, the teams changed direction. You could only move the ball by kicking it or batting it down the field with your feet, hands, heads, or sides. Rutgers had small players who were faster while Princeton had bigger players who were slower. One player was quoted saying, Though smaller on the average, the Rutgers players as it developed had ample speed and fine football sense. Receiving the ball, our men formed the perfect interface around it and with short, skillful kicks and dribbles drove it down the field. Taken by surprise, the Princeton men fought valiantly, but in five minutes we had gotten the ball through to our captains on the enemy's goal and two players neatly kicked it over. None thought of it, so far as I know, but we had, without previous plan or thought, evolved the play that became famous a few years later as the Flying Wedge. Rutgers was having great success with the wedge until J.E. Michaels, aka Big Mike, broke through the wedge. He did not attempt to take the ball, but instead wanted to break Rutgers' wedge. Big Mike consistently broke the Scarlet Knights wedge and Princeton was able to tie the game up with a kick themselves for the second score. One player said the flying wedge was thus checkmated. Rutgers might have been in a bad spot had not Madison Bell come through. He had a trick of kicking the ball with his heels. All the game he had been a puzzle to the Princetonians. The ball would be rolling towards the Rutgers goal and running ahead of it instead of taking time to turn, he would heal it back. He made several such plays greatly encouraging his team. Then he capped all of this by one tremendous lucky backwards drive directly to Dixon, standing squarely before Princeton's goal. Dixon easily scored, giving us a one goal lead. Big Mike again rose, however, in a berserk endeavor, and getting the ball he called the Princeton men into a flying wedge of their own, and straight away they took the ball right down the field and put it over. After that one Rutgers professor shrieked, you will come to no Christian end. Rutgers scored the fifth and sixth points, Later in the game, the ball would land near the fence where the students were sitting and two players ran into the fence, knocking it down and the students along with it. Then an unknown Rutgers player scored on his own team accidentally and Princeton held on to the momentum and scored again, tying the game 4-4. Four -four. 
Due to having smaller players, Leggett decided to have his team keep the ball close to the ground, and it worked as Rucker scored the 9th and 10th points to win the matchup 6-4. An article about the game showed up in Rucker's undergraduate newspaper, The Targum, and said to describe the varying fortunes of the match game by game would be a waste of labor for every game was like the one before, wrote the student reporter. There was the same headlong running, wild shouting, and frantic kicking. What happened after the first game is still unknown until today. One Princeton player said that Rutgers had run the losing team out of town. The local newspaper reported that the two teams came together and ate dinner after the game. This is the account that is believed to be true. Each school won the matchup that was played at their respective schools, and unfortunately the third game would not be played due to a crisis of overemphasis by the faculty at both institutions who believed the games were distracting the students from their schoolwork. The following season, Rutgers got Columbia University, located in New York City, to play against them, and over the next few years, most of the colleges and universities in the East were playing the game known as football. No one knew where the game of football was going to go in the early years, and no one could have predicted where it was going to go over the next 151 years. Football scheduling was inconsistent as some years Rutgers was able to schedule 10 games like in 1882, while other years they could only play one game like in 1885. In 1913, George Foster Sanford became coach at Rutgers and led the team to a 6-3 record in his first season. Before Rutgers, Sanford played center at Yale before becoming a head coach at Columbia. He then was head coach at Virginia in 1904 and took an unpaid job as an advisor at Yale before being hired by Rutgers. During 1915, Sanford was able to lead Rutgers to an undefeated season going 7-1 and finished 7-1-1 in 1917. Paul Robeson, an All-American running back, was a key part of Rutgers' success during those two seasons. They outscored opponents by an average of 44-3 during the 1915 season and 33-2 in the 1917 season. Rutgers became known to the New York metropolitan area during this time period, playing games at the polo grounds against the likes of Notre Dame, Nebraska, LSU, and West Virginia. Sanford finished his coaching career going 56-32-5 at Rutgers, which is fifth all-time, and 84-36-6 in his career. Sanford was later inducted into the Rutgers Hall of Fame. John Wallace replaced Sanford in 1924 and led Rutgers to a 7-1-1 record. Rutgers was led by Homer Hazel, a two-time All-American who played fullback for the Scarlet Knights. John Wallace had played quarterback at Rutgers under Sanford, and after his first successful season, he signed a three-year deal. Unfortunately, in 1925, Rutgers went 2-7 and, and went 3-6 in 1926. In February of 1927, the Rutgers Athletic Board decided to replace Wallace. In 1938, Rutgers hired Harvey Harmon. Harmon had coached at Penn from 1931 to 1937, where he recorded a record of 31-23-2. Harmon's first season was a successful one as he led Rutgers to a 7-1 record the year Rutgers dedicated their stadium. Rutgers won their dedication game 20-18 over Princeton. He coached at Rutgers from 1938 to 1941 before being replaced by Harry Rockefeller during World War II due to Harmon serving in the Navy. During Harmon's first tenure, he was able to lead Rutgers to back-to-back -back conference titles in 1938 and 1939 and two second-place finishes during 1940 and 1941. Harmon returned to Rutgers in 1946 and Rutgers achieved great success and was known as their golden era for Rutgers football. Rutgers won four straight conference titles from 1946 to 1949. During that time period, they were led by mainly World War II veterans and had their best record since 1891 going 8-1 in 1947. Harmon led Rutgers to three straight conference titles from 1952 to 1954 and coached his last season in 1955. Harmon finished with the fourth most wins in Rutgers history and was inducted into the College Football Hall of Fame in 1981. Harmon was replaced by John Stiegman in 1956. Stiegman brought back the single wing formation back to Rutgers and helped lead the Scarlet Knights to an 8-1 record in 1958. The only loss that season came to the Quantico Marines, 13-12, in which Rutgers' best player, Billy Austin, a two-time All-American, missed the game due to a broken hand. In 1960, Stiegman left Rutgers and started coaching at Penn. He finished his career at Rutgers going 22-15. John Bateman was hired as Stiegman's replacement in 1960. Bateman had played and was an assistant at Columbia before becoming the offensive line coach at Penn in 1957. Bateman led Rutgers to an 8-1 record during 1960 
and the school's first undefeated season in 1961 when the team went 9-0. Rutgers almost lost in their season finale against Columbia that season, but made a 25-point comeback in the fourth quarter. The 1961 team was led by All-American center Alex Kroll and finished the season ranked 15th in the nation. Bateman spent 13 seasons where he became the second winningest coach in school history going 73-51. Bateman was then replaced by Frank Burns, who would go on to become the winningest coach in Rutgers football history in 1973. Burns had played for Rutgers under Harmon and according to Rutgers history page, was known as a fierce linebacker who recorded 17 tackles in the college all-star game against the New York Giants. Burns' teams were known for their defense and fundamentals. His first team went 6-5 where J.J. Jennings rushed for 1,353 yards, which is third most in Rutgers history, and 21 touchdowns, which is second most in Rutgers history. From 1975 to 1979, Rutgers had five straight seasons winning seven games during the season and compiled a winning percentage of .803. The best part of the time stretch was when Rutgers went 11-0 in 1976, the best season in school history. In 1978, Burns led Rutgers to their first bowl game appearance when they played in the Garden State Bowl against Arizona State at Giant Stadium. The biggest win during Burns' tenure came in 1979 when Rutgers traveled down to Knoxville and upset Tennessee 13-7 on November 3, 1979. Burns called the win the greatest of my coaching career. In 1980, Rutgers played a Bear Bryant-led Alabama at Giant Stadium. Alabama was highly favored but survived the upset only winning 17-13. After the game, Bryant said, We didn't beat Rutgers. All I can say is we won. Burns struggled his last three seasons, finishing 5-6 and six twice and 3-8 and eight in his final season at Rutgers. After the three losing seasons, Burns was dismissed as head coach with a final record of 78-43-1. In 1984, Rutgers hired Dick Anderson as their brand new head coach. Anderson had served as an offensive line coach at Penn and Penn State before becoming the new Scarlet Knights head coach. Along with the hiring of Anderson, there was a renewed commitment to Rutgers football when the program received $3 million in a state funding package. The funds were used to build an artificial surface practice field, the practice bubble, which is still used today, and the Hale Center that had locker rooms, offices, and a weight training and medical facility area for the football team. During his inaugural season, Anderson went 7-3, which would be his best season at Rutgers. Rutgers upset nationally ranked teams like Penn State and Michigan State and Northwestern in a televised game, which would also be the program's 1,000th game. Players under Anderson included record pass breaker Scott Ernie, career tackles leader Tyron Stowe, and Eric Young, who was a star in both football and baseball. Anderson's last career game came in the Emerald Isle Classic against Pittsburgh. The game took place in Dublin, Ireland, and was the first time the Rutgers football team played overseas. He was relieved of his duties in 1990 and finished with a record of 28-33-4 as head coach. Doug Graber replaced Anderson for the 1990 season. Graber coached at the high school level, college level, and NFL level and was the defensive coordinator for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers from 1987 to 1989. Graber focused on recruiting the best talent from the state of New Jersey. His first recruiting class included three first-team All-State selections and two second-team All-State selections, and the recruiting class consisted of 12 players from the great state of New Jersey. Rutgers also joined the Big East Conference in 1991. The first Big East win came against Boston College 20-13, and in their first two seasons in the Big East, the Scarlet Knights went 13-9. In 1994, Rutgers celebrated 125 years of football and returned to playing at newly renovated Rutgers Stadium. Since the stadium opened in 1938, Rutgers had compiled a 237-120-4 record. After Grabber's first two seasons, both of which were winning seasons, Rutgers suffered three losing seasons, and Rutgers moved on from him. Fun fact, Grabber went on to be the head coach of the Frankfurt Galaxy in 2001 for NFL Europe. Terry Shea replaced Grabber for the 1996 football season. Shea was originally from San Mateo, California, and graduated from the University of Oregon. Shea spent most of his coaching career on the West Coast. Well, the West Coast coach was not very successful, as he never had a winning record. In 1996, Rutgers went 2-9. In 1997, they went 0-11. In 1998, they went 5-6, and, and Shea won Big East Coach of the Year. Well, in 1999, a great year by the way, Rutgers went 1-10. 
In 2000, Shea finished his career with a 3-8 record and didn't win a single game in the Big East. Terry Shea finished with an 11-44 record for Rutgers and is one of the losingest coaches in Rutgers history. On December 1, 2000, Rutgers announced who would be the next coach of the program. Greg Schiano was hired to become the head coach of Rutgers on December 1, 2000 and took over the program at the turn of the century. Schiano was a New Jersey native born in Wyckoff, New Jersey. He played linebacker at Bucknell before becoming an assistant coach at Ramapo High School in 1988. In 1989, Schiano became a grad assistant at Rutgers before joining Penn State under the same title in 1990. In 1991, he became the defensive backs coach and held that position until being hired by the Chicago Bears in 1996 as a defensive assistant. Then he became the defensive back coach for the Bears for the 1998 season. Schiano then became the defensive coordinator of the University of Miami in 1999. Shiano held that position for two years, and while he was with the Hurricanes, his defense ranked top 15 in points allowed in 1999 and top 5 in 2000. During his brief time with Miami, he coached NFL Pro Bowlers Ed Reed, Jonathan Vilma, and Dan Morgan. When Shiano was hired by Rutgers, the program was not doing too well, like I mentioned earlier in the series. Shiano needed to rejuvenate the program with talent, and that is exactly what he did. He did a pretty good job with his first three recruiting classes and started to improve the program. During his opening press conference, Shiano said, we're going to win at Rutgers and we're going to do it the right way, even mentioning he was going to lead Rutgers to a national title. During 2001, Rutgers went 2-9 and 0-7 and in the Big East. The following season, they went 1-11 and 0-7 and and again in the Big East. During his third season, Rutgers missed out on a bowl game but ended the season on a positive note when they upset Syracuse 24-7 during the season finale. In 2004, Rutgers went 4-7 but hosted their largest crowd at the time when 42,612 people watched the Scarlet Knights beat Michigan State 19-14. In 2005, Shiano led Rutgers to the best record in over a decade when they went 7-5 and, and earned their first bowl bid since 1978. Rutgers played the same team they played in 1978 in the Insight Bowl against Arizona State. The Sun Devils and Scarlet Knights put on a show at Chase Field in a shootout that Rutgers would lose 45-40. This would also be the last time that Chase Field would be the venue of this game. In 2006, Rutgers achieved their first top 10 ranking in school history and finished with a record of 11-2. The second time in school history, the Scarlet Knights would win 11 games. During the wild season, Rutgers upset Louisville on a Thursday night game that was nationally televised 28-25. At the time, Louisville was the third ranked team and the Scarlet Knights came back from an 18 point deficit. After the game, Rutgers fans stormed the field and the game would be named Pandemonium in Piscataway. This game was known as a turning point for Rutgers football during the modern times. Rutgers finished the season ranked 12th in the nation and Chiano was named both Big East Coach of the Year and National Coach of the Year. The success Rutgers achieved in 2006 was what Shiano had envisioned and promised during his press conference years before. Rutgers won their first ever bowl game when they beat Kansas State 37-10 in the Texas Bowl. Ryan Leonard, Rutgers running back, won the Drady Trophy, which is known as the Heisman for academics. Leonard was actually viewed as a Heisman contender in 2006, but took a diminished role becoming more of a blocker during the season, allowing Ray Rice to become a star. During 2007, Rutgers took down second-ranked USF 30-27, the highest-ranked win in school history. They finished the season with a 52-30 win over Ball State at the International Bowl in Toronto. Ray Rice broke the single-game rushing record, finishing with 280 yards in the game. Rice finished the season as a Heisman candidate and an All-American pick. In three seasons, Rice ran for 4,926 yards and 49 touchdowns on 910 attempts. He finished a 2007 season with 2,012 yards and 24 touchdowns, would be drafted by the Baltimore Ravens in the second round of the 2008 draft. Rutgers finished the season with an 8-5 record. In 2008, Rutgers struggled at the beginning of the season, but due to the strong foundation Chiano had created, held the team together, and they would rattle off seven consecutive wins and beat NC State 29-23 in the PapaJohns.com Bowl. The Scarlet Knights finished the season 8-5 and 5-2 and and in the Big East. In 2009, Rutgers set some milestones as they had their fourth wide receiver to eclipse 1,000 yards with Tim Brown. Before Shiano got to Rutgers, they had never had a single 1,000-yard receiver. Brown also became the school's all-time receiving touchdowns leader, passing Kenny Britt, who was a former first-round draft pick. During the season, Rutgers finished with a 9-4 record and won their fourth straight bowl game when they beat UCF in the St. Petersburg Bowl. During the 2010 draft, 
Anthony Davis became the highest pick in program history when he went 11th overall to the San Francisco 49ers. Devin McCourty was also selected in the first round when he was drafted 27th overall by the New England Patriots. During the 2010 season, Rucker struggled on the field, but that was not the focus throughout the season. Eric Legrand would suffer a serious spinal cord injury at MetLife Stadium on October 16th against Army. Legrand has since become an inspiring person as he has brought attention to spinal cord research. Legrand has done amazing things since his injury. He has since become a public speaker, founder of Team Legrand, which helps individuals living with spinal cord injuries, Shop 52, and most recently, Legrand Coffee House, which is opening during the summer of 2021 in his hometown of Woodbridge, New Jersey. Legrand has become an inspiration for New Jerseyans and many more, including myself, so let me know if you want me to do a video on him in the future. Legrand became the first person in Rutgers history to have his jersey retired, which occurred on September 14, 2013. In 2011, Rutgers bounced back from a 4-8 season the year before and went 9-4. They beat Army in a game at Yankee Stadium and played a second game at the stadium when they played Iowa State in the Pinstripe Bowl. Mohamed Sanu broke the single-season records for receptions with 115, which also meant that Rutgers fans chanted the name Sanu 115 times. One of my favorite things watching Rutgers in person or seeing them play on TV. Sanu also went on to be drafted in the third round of the 2012 draft by the Cincinnati Bengals. After this season, Shiano announced he was leaving Rutgers to take the head coaching job for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Shiano finished his first tenure at Rutgers, foreshadowing, wink wink, with a 68 and 67 record where he would go 5 and 1 in bowl games, winning his last 5. The one thing Shiano never did was win a conference title at Rutgers. Kyle Flood was promoted from assistant head coach to head coach after Shiano departed for the NFL. Flood was originally from New York and attended Iona for college. He served as the offensive line coach for St. Francis Prep, CW Post, Hofstra, and Delaware from 1993 to 2004. He was then hired as the offensive line coach at Rutgers in 2005. From 2005 to 2011, on top of being the offensive line coach, he also served as run game coordinator in 2007, assistant head coach from 2008 to 2011, and offensive coordinator in 2009 and 2010. Other than Flood, Rutgers looked at Mario Cristobal as a possible head coach candidate who was at FIU at the time and also offered Ron Rivera, according to Bleacher Report. During Flood's first season, Rutgers went 9-4 and and finished tied for first in the Big East, winning the school's first Big East title. Flood was named the Big East Coach of the Year, which he shared with Charlie Strong at Louisville. Flood set the records for most first season wins in Rutgers history, and Flood had multiple players win different awards. The defensive unit was one of the best in school history, finishing 4th in scoring defense, 9th in turnovers, and 10th in total defense. On the offensive end, Brandon Coleman had 10 receiving touchdowns, which tied a school record. The Scarlet Knights would lose to Virginia Tech in the Russell Athletic Bowl, 13-10, in overtime. Rutgers had a school record 7 players drafted and 12 players signed with NFL teams. In 2013, Rutgers suffered an overtime loss to Fresno State 52-51 in a game I remembered talking to my friends about years ago. After that game, they went on a four-game win streak, including a comeback win over Arkansas, the first time an SEC team traveled to High Point Solution Stadium. The Big East had turned into the American Conference, and Rutgers won their first conference game 55-52 in triple overtime. Rutgers became bowl eligible on senior night and once again traveled to Yankee Stadium to play in the New Era Pinstripe Bowl, where they played a ranked Notre Dame and lost 29-16. Then on July 1st, 2014, Rutgers officially joined the Big Ten Conference. Rutgers had joined the conference in hopes of increasing national exposure and to make more television revenue. The Big Ten added Rutgers for the purpose of TV money and access to the New York City market. The Big Ten commissioner also said they added Rutgers due to their athletic excellence. Granted, Rutgers' other sports have either been able to compete right off the bat or were able to build themselves up over the past six years to compete. The football team has struggled. Attendance at games has dwindled over the years to the point that sometimes it seems like there are more opposing fans in the stands than the Rutgers fans. Back in 2018, Rutgers' athletic department had been operating in the red for multiple years. Their athletic facilities are not up to par as they still use that dastardly bubble, which I talked about in part two and was in almost a decade ago, and it still seemed old then. Luckily, they will start making the full television revenue this year, so hopefully things will get better. In their first year in the Big Ten, things actually look like they may go well. After going 6-7 and seven the previous year, they improved to 8-5 and five and went 3-5 and five in Big Ten play. During their first Big Ten home game against Penn State, 
They had a record-breaking crowd of 53,774 in attendance and beat Michigan on October 4th for the first Big Ten win. They also came back from a 35-10 deficit against Maryland and won 41-38, making it the biggest comeback in school history. Gary Nova, God, that is a name I haven't talked about in years, became the all-time touchdown passing leader with 73 in 2014. Rutgers beat North Carolina 40-21 in the Quick Lane Bowl. This made it their ninth bowl game in a 10-year span, and it would also be their last bowl game. Things were looking up for Rutgers, but then 2015 happened. Under Flood and Ash, there were a lot of off-the-field issues at Rutgers. During the 2015 season, there were alleged misconducts by Kyle Flood. Many thought Flood would resign or be fired before the season opener, and Rutgers Board of Governors had an emergency meeting. Flood was suspended for breaking rules when it came to contact between coaches and professors. Flood would be fired along with Athletic Director Julie Herman later that year. Rutgers finished with a 4-8 record, and Kyle Flood finished with a record of 27-24. The coach hired to replace Flood was Ohio State defensive coordinator Chris Ash. Ash was born in Iowa and had played defensive back at Drake. He then made stops at Iowa State twice, San Diego State, Wisconsin, and Arkansas before being hired to coach at Ohio State in 2014. Ash was hired due to his background with winning and his experience in the Big Ten. Chris Ash's first season did not go well as Rutgers went 2-10 and 0-9 and and in Big Ten play and was shut out four times. They lost to Michigan State 49-0, Michigan 78-0, Ohio State 58-0, and Penn State 39-0. Rutgers improved to 4-8 in 2017. Rutgers also opened a brand new football practice complex. Rutgers went 1-11 in 2018. Many thought Ash would be fired after the season, but Rutgers had just extended his contract and didn't want to pay the buyout. Off-the-field issues still occurred under Ash. Ash survived the offseason, but after five games in 2019, he was fired. Ash was supposed to bring a winning culture. Instead, he finished his career with an 8-33 record and a 3-27 record in the Big Ten. Ash finished as one of the losingest coaches in Rutgers history. Ash was never able to keep New Jersey players in the state as many of New Jersey's top talent left for the likes of Ohio State, Penn State, Michigan, and Wisconsin. It also seems like the coaches who are not from the New Jersey, New York area are unable to succeed at Rutgers. People from New Jersey are different. As a fellow Jersey and myself, if you aren't from the area, it's hard to connect with us. Rutgers Losingists, full-time coaches were from Iowa and California. So who was Rutgers going to replace Ash with? After Rutgers fired their head coach, Greg Schiano started to be rumored to return to Rutgers. Well, in late November, that deal seemed to be dead as Rutgers and Schiano could not get the numbers right. As one article wrote, of course the deal fell through, because it's Rutgers. Shiano wanted a realistic chance at winning in Piscataway, and that involved multiple expenditures. Rutgers did not really want to spend the money. The fan base was pissed that Rutgers was about to blow it with Shiano, and the media turned to who else Rutgers could go after. Names that were linked to the Rutgers job included Butch Jones, Joe Moorhead, Jeff Halfley, and others. Well, the deal with Shiano was not dead as originally thought, and the two were able to agree on a brand new deal. There were actually rumors that Governor Phil Murphy got a lot of calls, emails, and tweets and got involved with the hiring of Shiano. Shiano signed an eight-year deal where he will be making over $4 million per season. Shiano showed he really cared about the Rutgers program during his opening press conference. He is beloved by the Rutgers fan base and he loves the Rutgers fan base. I was at a Rutgers basketball game earlier this year and Shiano was shown in the stands and the rack went crazy. It truly felt like Rutgers was going in the right direction. Shiano went right to work helping Rutgers finish with the 61st best recruiting class in the nation for 2020. So far in the 2021 class, Rutgers has the 41st best recruiting class and signed two four-stars from the state of New Jersey, their first four-star since the 2017 class. Although it's early, he currently has the 18th best class for the 2022 class. Going into 2020, everyone looked at Rutgers' opening game against Monmouth. That was until the events of 2020 occurred. After canceling the season, the Big Ten returned with a conference-only schedule. Everyone expected Rutgers to lose every single game, but when they opened the season up against Michigan State, they won 38-27, their first conference win since they beat Maryland at home on November 4th, 2017, an almost three-year streak. Although they would go on a four-game losing streak, there was a major change in the program because they were competing losing heartbreakers to Illinois and Michigan. They got their first Big Ten road win since October 14th, 2017, when they beat Purdue and beat Maryland on the road a few weeks later. They lost a close game to Nebraska to finish the season. They finished with a 3-6 record and it looks like the future may be bright for the Scarlet Knights. 
I grew up going to Rutgers games as a kid, and it was heartbreaking and embarrassing to see how the stands have been filled, or the lack thereof being filled, for years. If fans are allowed back in the stands in 2021, I expect them to be filled for the home opener against Temple on September 4th. If you enjoyed the History of series, leave a like, share, and subscribe to the channel, and let me know what school you want to see in the future.